We're heading towards the next stop on our epic journey around the coast of South Africa. That's Robben Island, about 10 kilometers in our wake. And this body of water sprawled out before us is Table Bay. No ordinary stretch of sea, as it's been a crossroads for shipping for centuries and the epicenter of South African history. But there's more to the mother city than its castle, its famous harbor, and its iconic mountain. And to explore this tavern of the seas, I'll be joined by our usual team of experts. This week, Eleanor's dining out on seafood with a peculiar troop of locals. Nomalunga searches for an outbreak of bubonic plague and discovers a unique timepiece. Gavin's getting his sea legs, diving for a 200-year-old slave ship. Lovely. <laughs> And I will be seeking refuge from the Southeaster, living the Dolce Vita and witnessing some gunplay at high noon. For now, though, it's time to take it all in. So, welcome to Cape Town and the shoreline of the Mother City. Ninety-five percent of all fruit coming into or leaving South Africa is transported by sea. Sixty percent of which passes through here, making Cape Town Harbour the second largest container terminal in South Africa. The Kauri knew the Cape as Kamisa, the place of sweet waters. But in the 16th century, Europeans were less interested in the water than they were in oriental spices and slaves from the East Indies. But it wasn't until 1652 that the Dutch East India Company finally founded a refreshment station here at the Cape. Their fort, or castle, as it was rather grandiosely named, remains a symbol of the Cape's colonial heritage. The flags flying over its moat, representing in chronological order the administrations that have occupied this place of sweet waters ever since, leaving behind new landmarks. Britain bequeathed vast Victorian columns from the imposing Parliament to Rhodes Memorial, a monument to empire building. The harbour too was built by Victorian engineers. And when Britain left, the new Union of South Africa government continued, pushing back the ocean and reclaiming 230 hectares of the bay to extend Cape Town beyond its original boundaries. The political and cultural landmarks of the Cape are dwarfed by the greatest icon of them all. The Portuguese named it Tabua de Cabo, Table of the Cape. The Dutch dubbed it Tafelberg. For the Europeans, the mountain was a blank canvas on which to paint their fears and fantasies of the dark continent. And for four centuries, its enigmatic shape had been interpreted and reinterpreted. But hundreds of years before Europeans first laid eyes on it and projected their images and ideals upon it, the mountain had a name. Hurik Wahu, Mountain in the Sea. Today, that name endowed by the original people who lived in its shadow is still the most apt. Table Mountain still seems to rise straight out of the sea, despite 300 years of settlement having left a city sprawled out around it. But many people believe that instead of detracting from the mountain's mystery, the city of Cape Town actually adds to its enigma. The Cape Peninsula is full of contrasts between urban and wild spaces but never more so than here on the first crags of the front face of the mountain. Here, where you can clearly hear traffic and barking dogs, nature still rules. Table Mountain is intertwined with the identity of Capetonians and the whole country. 
Seen from Malkbos across the bay, it was a symbol of colonial oppression, while for Europeans it represented a sought-after trophy. From behind the bars of Robben Island, it served as an emblem of liberation and hope. But for one son of this soil, it's a lifelong and intimate companion. Table Mountain's been kind of my backyard, and I have been coming here since I was... My parents first brought me up Table Mountain when I was very little. I was carried up here on this, my father's shoulders. Yeah? It's been home from home, backyard walking since forever. <laughs> the path goes through here, and then up this gorge. There's such a huge diversity of plant life up here. If you actually look at the Cape Peninsula, the Table Mountain National Park, there are almost 2,000 different species in that small area. That is more plant species than are contained in the whole of the British Isles. Uh, that's a lot of different plants. Say no more. <laughs> the name Fainbos is derived from the fine leaf vegetation. These very fine leaves, like the Erica's got fine leaves, the Clifortia here has got fine leaves. You have to have Erica's in your Fainbos. You have to have Restios and you have to have proteus. It's the three most important fundamental parts of Feinbos. So Feinbos is a collective term for a form of vegetation that includes at least these three species. That's correct. Looks like there was a fire here recently. Well, Feinbos is also a fire-driven ecosystem, so fire is not bad in the system. Fire is actually quite good for the system. A fire comes through, it'll take the top of this Watsonia off, but it's a bulb, it's sitting underneath the ground, and it'll come back up again after the fire. So yes, a fire goes through all of this fame bus here, and it's what we would think, it, it's gone. Mm. It's not gone. It's, it's rejuvenating, it's going through a whole cycle, a whole different suite of species will come up. If you look up the slope, and you can see all the dead bushes in the slope, but then you go down into the gorge, and you actually see that the vegetation change. That's where the trees are lurking. Trees can't come up onto the slope because the fires will constantly come through here at, at an uh, interval that is too regular to allow for trees to come in. Hey, this section of the trail looks almost man-made, but how does a feature like this occur naturally? Well, it's because you have the soft basement rock and this much harder sandstone sitting on top and between that, you have a, a very soft mudstone, much like the meat between a sandwich. Mm. And the mudstone is really, this stuff is really, really soft. And because it's so soft, the, the northwesterly winds with, uh, where our rains come from actually erodes it out. And so this is just purely water and wind erosion that forms this stuff. What stops it all from coming tumbling down right now? Well, I and mean, this is just, it's just the tension of this rock. This is really hard rock. I mean, you know, it's not going to come off. It's, <coughs> it's, it's really hard stuff. It's just the tension of the rock. The Table Mountain means something different to everyone. Uh, Madiba, for instance, when he was a prisoner on Robben Island, he said that for him, it represented a beacon of hope, the mainland to which he would one day return. I remember that, and it was a very poignant moment for me. It meant a lot to me, too because the mountain means just so much to me when I'm away from Table Mountain for very, any length of time uh, and I come back again, I have to go for a walk on Table Mountain. And I play all kinds of games on it. I'm interested in the vegetation, I'm interested in the geology, I'm interested in some of the more serious rock climbs on the mountain. How the water moves on it, the plant life. In fact, I have a PhD in botany primarily because I got so interested in how things work on the mountain. If we were actually to take and blow up this whole mountain completely, boom, gone, what would the city be? What would the people in the city be? Nothing would be here. If you talk to anybody in the city, even if they've never walked up the mountain, you talk to those people and they will say the mountain is important to them, the mountain is an important aspect of, of Cape Town. And in fact, if you talk to people from Joburg, they say it's an important part of, of South Africa. So, it, you know, the mountain means a lot to a lot of people. The, the, this mountain belongs to everybody. Um, it belongs to all the people of Cape Town and anybody who wants to walk on it. I would like to see a lot more people walking on the mountain. It is beautiful up here, but the weather on Table Mountain is notoriously changeable. A clear afternoon of perfect sunshine can quickly disappear under the mountain's massive tablecloth, a rolling blanket of cloud whipped up by the southeaster.
One particularly tall tale told by Dutch settlers insists that the cloud was caused by a marathon all-night pipe-smoking duel between a sea captain called Van Hunks and the devil himself. While a Kosa fable holds that the mountain is a sleeping giant, the Watcher of the South, posted here by the first gods to keep watch against a monstrous sea serpent, Nganyamba, while they finished raising up the dry land from the sea. The mountain is a place of myth and legend, but so too is the bay in its shadow. Van Hunks and the devil command the crags up here, but the sea is ruled by a different despot. Jonathan Sharpman is one of the few maritime archaeologists in South Africa. Today we're searching Table Bay for a ship that went down in the mid-1700s. Maritime archaeology differs from archaeology on land in several ways, apart from the most obvious. The archaeological deposits, the wrecks themselves, are like time capsules. They're like captured moments that contain the artifacts that people thought were important at the time of the voyage and they represent accidental loss on a grand scale. And then there's the preserving power of the seabed. Things decay or rot largely through exposure to oxygen. That's why we preserve food by sealing it in airtight cans and vacuum packs. On the ocean floor, there's much less oxygen, so the conditions for preservation are much better than on land-based archaeological sites. This is the magnetometer. It picks up changes in the Earth's magnetic field caused by anomalies on, on shipwrecks like ferrous metals. Basically what we do is drag it in grids up and down behind the boat and see if we see any changes. We can monitor what's happening on the laptop as we go and if we see spikes in the, the little line that's drawn on the laptop we can mark those as potential wreck sites and uh, come back and dive them a bit later. And what shipwreck are you looking for here? At the moment we're looking for La Cibelle. It's a French slaver that went down in 1756. We don't know exactly where it is. We've, from the records, we know that it was somewhere in Table Bay and somewhere around the Bloberg area. So we've set up some grids here and we're going to drag the magnetometer around and see if we can pick up anything as we go. We know we've got almost 3,000 shipwrecks that we know of around the southern coastline. Yeah, so it, and it's a long, long history of, of shipping. Everybody was coming by here. and yeah, the last uh, 500 years or so. Exactly. And, uh, yeah, in the scramble for profit and trying to get to the east, every nationality you can think of was sailing around South Africa and, fortunately for us, getting washed up on, on the rocks and the beaches around the coast. What do we know about this wreck? We actually know very little about this, the ship itself. We know that it was French, we know that it was built in France, and we know that it was wrecked here in a storm. We know that it had 12 guns. We don't know much at all uh, worldwide about French slave traders, so this really is going to be something very, very interesting. Was there complete loss of life when the ship went down? No, it, it, it's quite a rare uh, occurrence actually. Everybody got off the ship, but the crew and the slaves were all got safely to shore. The slaves were taken to Cape Town and either sent on or, or sold locally. And, uh, so they became part of Cape Town history as well, which is, is a nice aspect for us to look at. The public always associates maritime archaeology with treasure hunting. That's always the public perception that, that these ships are laden with treasure. Everybody thinks you find a shipwreck and there's a a chest with an octopus over it and you open it up and there's gold and silver coins. And that is the case in, in some, well, without the octopus, that, that is the case in, in, in some of these sites. It really is a, a fascinating aspect of, of shipwrecks and, and maritime archaeology. So let's have a look on the, the laptop and see what the magnetometer is bringing up. We're getting into the area now, so we should get over something quite soon. So that line over there, as you can see that undulating line, is, is the change in the magnetic field. That looks very much like a shipwreck to me. We're in the right area. So uh, all that we need to do now is get in the water and see what we can find. Does this tell us where sharks are in the area? That's a shark right there. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's go. <laughs> Of 
because preservation is so good underwater. It is fantastic. Uh, and people really don't associate shipwrecks with good preservation. But once the, the ship sinks into the anaerobic environment, the little animals that tend to eat wood and, and organic matter don't live there. So things are, are perfectly preserved. And, and we found incredible things on shipwreck sites that, that just don't exist anywhere else, from as delicate a, a thing as a book to objects wrapped in, in paper with a string and, and leather and, and all sorts of things still attached. And it can contribute a huge amount to history that we don't get anywhere else. Today the finds include a fork and a dimpled cannonball, two more pieces to catalogue and to add to our growing puzzle of the past. Just over a century ago, this harbour was at the heart of Britain's war effort in South Africa. It was 1900 and Queen Victoria was pouring troops into the country to send north against the Boer Republics. Imagine this harbour packed with thousands of English soldiers and hundreds of dock workers loading cranes and wrestling skittish horses down the gangplanks. Imagine the dust and the noises and the smell. Now in all that activity, it would have been quite easy to overlook a couple of dead rats along the quayside. Unfortunately for the people working in this harbour, that's the sort of oversight that would prove quite deadly. Professor Nigel Worden of the University of Cape Town has been exploring the history of this city for 12 years and he's joining me to take up the story. What was the significance of a few dead rats at the harbour? Oh, well, dead rats is bad news because what that indicated was that the bubonic plague uh, had, had come to Cape Town. Like the Black Death that killed a third of the population of Europe in the Middle Ages. And it was still very much uh, in existence in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And it was brought to Cape Town by the fleas in the forage of the hay that had been brought from Argentina to feed the horses in the South African War. And it caused great panic in Cape Town. And the medical authorities determined that they should isolate people who had been exposed to the plague. And many of the people who were working on the harbour were uh, housed there, right opposite us, at the, at the convict barracks. Many of them were from the Eastern Cape. They were migrant workers who'd been recruited by the harbour board, and they were brought down to Cape Town to work on the docks. And they did two things. First of all, they moved them into a new barracks, a new location, as they called it, which was built right over there. Um, over there, right where opposite those us. New penthouses are were once barracks. Absolutely. I mean, this is on the the prime real estate of Cape Town. This is where the, the the location was placed. Also, there were a number of people who worked on the docks who were from mainly from the Eastern Cape who lived in the in the town, and they were rounded up and forced to move out of Cape Town to uh, the area that we know as Outflucht. It was called, meaning the fleeing out of the of the city. It was a kind of isolation area for people who've been exposed to the to the plague and it was about eight miles out of the city so they were moved quite a distance away from where they originally worked absolutely i mean this this was part of the problem and they complain about this a lot of protest about it because they realized that they had to pay high rail fares to get into the town to where they were working here at the harbor and in fact the complaints that they had were taken up by a rather remarkable man his name was alfred mangena he was training to be a lawyer, and he fought on behalf of the people who'd been moved. And he was quite a, quite a character, and uh, in fact, he's still remembered in the, in the 1930s, 1940s, he's still remembered as Mangena. They celebrated Mangena Day as a result. Because presumably these forced removals would have actually affected the black residents of the town, even though the plague affected everybody. Yeah. Well, that's right. I mean, plague is no respecter of race. Because it started here and it affected the people who were the, the, uh, the dock workers right, right over there, it meant that most of the people were, were the African laborers who were working here. And as a result of that, it was they who were isolated and segregated. So it was right here at the heart of the waterfront that was the basis of the first forced removal which took place in Cape Town. 60 years before the forced removals at District 6. Absolutely, yeah. 1901. Of course today there's all this glitz and fun you'd never think. Exactly. It's a bit ironic, isn't it? Yeah.
If you know where to look, the harbour is full of historical monuments, some of them not quite so easy to reach. I'm heading up to the top end of the waterfront to the famous Table Bay Time Ball. Today, all the ships along this dock have a GPS navigating system. Captains can find their position by simply pressing a button. But 200 years ago, it was a very different story. Captains could fix their latitude by observing the stars, but finding their longitude was a little bit more complicated. It required very precise timekeeping, and the instruments used in the 1800s were far from the precision timepieces that we have today. What captains in Table Bay needed was state-of-the-art timekeeping. So in 1820, a royal observatory was founded in the Cape to provide ships with the all-important time signal. But the problem of distance remained. How do you signal the time from the observatory to the harbor several kilometers away? The solution came in 1836, courtesy of the astronomer Sir Thomas McClear. The system was simple but effective. A large ball was hauled up a mast just before 1 p.m. Cape Mean Time and then dropped at the stroke of 1. Shipmasters in port could then use this time ball to check the accuracy of their chronometers, which were instruments that helped them to determine longitude while at sea. By the late 1800s, there was a time ball in every major port from Simons Town to Durban. But in Cape Town, the city's expansion now blocked the view from the bay to the city. And so a new time ball was hoisted up on a 10 meter tall tower here at Alfred Dock. But the city didn't stop growing, and so in 1904, the time ball was raised again. The ball dropped for the last time in 1934 almost a century from when it was first hoisted up on the observatory. The age of the time ball had come to an end. But there was another option. They realized that they could effectively relay the time through the use of sound. Under British rule, that sound was an almighty bang, provided by a pair of cannon mounted at the castle and fired at 1 p.m. sharp. The masters of ships have the benefit of both sound and sight, hearing the crack of the cannon or seeing the puff of white smoke. But as the city grew, so too did resistance to the daily blast, now moved an hour earlier to signal noon. Not only had it become a fire hazard, but its thunder was spooking Cape Town's more genteel pedestrians. And so in 1902, the gun together with its understudy, both actual relics from the Battle of Musenberg in 1795, was hauled all the way up here to the top of Signal Hill by Oxwagon, where ever since it's been marking high noon every day, with the exception of Sundays and public holidays. Still receiving its signal from observatory some 10 kilometers away, as it had done since 1864. In those days, through the medium of a flare and these days via GPS satellite technology. However, the business end of this gun, the end that goes bang, is still distinctively old school. The cannon has now been packed with 1.3 kilograms of gunpowder. So, even armed with my earmuffs, I would do well to keep a safe distance. 80 milliseconds before noon, the signal is sent from the observatory. Within a flash, it's over and most visitors head back down to the city in search of less explosive attractions. In Cape Town, you never need to look far to find a living tradition. And here in Burkhap or Upper Town, Tradition provides the heartbeat of a city. With its cobbled streets and brightly painted houses, the Bulkarp is a vibrant village within a city. In the Malay quarters of Bulkarp, doors are always open, and it would be so easy to lose an entire afternoon up here. But the coast is calling. 
The heart of the old city is surprisingly compact. I'm back near the V&A waterfront and heading towards Mully Point and Green Point, where they're almost unbroken lines of upmarket beachfront apartment blocks. But the developers haven't overrun everything. And here, sandwiched between the Somerset Hospital and the new Greenpoint Stadium, they are still relics of a very different Cape Town. This is Fort Wynyard on the coast of Mully Point. If you've lived in Cape Town all your life and have never heard about it, you are not alone. Because today, there's almost no indication that a hundred years ago, this place was a major military installation. During the South African War, the garrison at Fort Wynyard was tasked with guarding Boer prisoners held as far away from the front as possible. The Greenpoint Common, once a racetrack, had been commandeered by the British Army, and the result was one of the few prisoner of war camps anywhere in the world with a Victorian grandstand looming over it. Camp Wynyard remained armed and vigilant as the wars of the 20th century came and went, until finally in 1976 it was declared a national monument. From here on the promenade, this seems a comfortable coastline with its affluent homes and restaurants. But beyond its pleasant lifestyle lies an ocean that couldn't be less domesticated. The Greenpoint Lighthouse built in 1824 is the oldest operating lighthouse on the South African coast. And it is one of the most enduring and attractive landmarks along this promenade. However, unwary skippers must make no mistake, they might be only a hundred meters from the seeming security of these plush penthouses and putting greens. But this is still the brutal Atlantic. Just one of those ships to learn that lesson the hard way was the 8,000-ton vessel Seafarer, a South African cargo carrier. Venturing too close during a winter storm in 1966, she found herself being driven ashore. Horrified residents watched as the seafarer was pounded by mountain seas, threatening to break her up just 50 meters from the shore. And time seemed to be running out for the 63 crew members and 12 passengers aboard. But in one of this coast's most daring feats, the pilots of 17 Squadron of the South African Air Force braved blinding sprays and lashing winds to pluck the entire ship's company to safety. Soon after the last survivor was set down on the common, the ship broke up. And today, her pieces still litter the seabed along this coastline. These rocks here at Seapoint are a national monument. They owe their status to another ship. Luckily this time though, one that survived. The HMS Beagle never touched these rocks, but one of her passengers did. And he went on to shake the modern world to the very bedrock of its foundation. That passenger was none other than one Charles Darwin. Darwin had barely finished his studies when he boarded the Beagle in the winter of 1831. And although the epic five-year circumnavigation would make his name as a naturalist, the young graduate had mainly been invited aboard as a companion for Captain Robert Fitzroy. Almost five years later, in June of 1836, the Beagle dropped anchor at Simonstown to take on supplies for a long voyage home. Darwin's cabin was bulging with notebooks and cabinets stuffed with samples and specimens from South America and Oceania the Pacific and Indian Oceans. And despite having already catalogued two continents, he couldn't resist one more expedition to the Cape Peninsula's most famous geological site. Geologist John Compton from the University of Cape Town shares Darwin's infatuation with the planet's oldest structures. So what is it that got Darwin so excited about this point? Well, Sea Point represents, represented a very hot controversy at the time. Geologists at that stage, which were very early stages 
of geology as a science, and there was a very hot controversy going on yeah. about the origin of rocks, rocks that we see here at Sea Point. And there was a group in Germany which believed that these granitic type rocks, these crystalline rocks, precipitated from seawaters. And Darwin belonged to the other group, which was based in Scotland and then Britain, which believed that, in fact, these were hot rocks. They were originally molten magma that had come up from below and had intruded into the Malmesbury, pushing it aside, mixing with some of it, and that the crystals we see in there, these large white crystals, all precipitated from the magma, from the liquid rock, and therefore would have been very hot. And so this was termed in a hot contact by Darwin, and he came here essentially to counter-argue what some earlier German scientists had argued at the same locality and he argued very convincingly for the theory of the Plutonist. And from then on, really, uh, most geologists no longer believed in the formation of rocks like these from seawater, but that they were actually coming up from below and as hot molten rock. Mm. So that, these sorts of structures then were very fundamental to the early arguments and geological discussions about the origins of rocks, what they meant, and here was a very good, clear-cut example that it had clearly been a forceful, intense injection of magma as a molten rock to have formed these amazing flow-like textures that we see here at Sea Point. So as the shoreline is constantly shifting, this rock formation at that time would have been way below sea level. Well, yeah, this only became at sea level with the erosion up till now. Uh, so it took a long time, because as you erode stuff from the surface, the buoyancy from below causes the stuff to rise up, and it continually erodes off gradually. I want to show you evidence for how this supercontinent then started to break apart. And the various continents of South America going west, Antarctica going south, India going north into Asia, Madagascar departing, which essentially formed our coastline uh, about 200, 250 million years ago. Our beloved Table Mountain could very easily have been on another continent. Sure. Table Mountain could have been part of a famous South American city rather than Cape Town if the split had occurred further to the east than it did. The best way to get to where we're going is to drive there. This stretch of road is one of the most spectacular the peninsula has to offer. Four kilometers of high-rise luxury, glass and steel. But look past the glitz and it's still a landscape of exquisite beauty. Just 80 years ago, this entire shoreline was a backwater, a sparsely populated retreat. Most tourism was by rail into the interior, but by the 1930s, as life became more mobile and fluid, Cape Townians began exploring their own backyard, and this paradise quickly became a favorite destination for a Sunday drive or a weekend getaway. Chapman's Peak Drive was built in 1922, and even by today's standards, it remains a startling piece of engineering. Sheer cliffs above and below means it's not a trip for the nervous driver. Rock falls have forced the city to build massive retaining structures above the road and restrict access. Despite its temperamental nature, it remains Cape Town's most spectacular route. Wow. This is where I wanted to take you to show you that evidence I mentioned earlier about continental breakup. When South America and Antarctica broke away from Africa and Gondwana was no more. And so to the far distant ocean to the west there, if you look out that way, you would find, of course, South America many, many kilometers away, mm -hmm. and it continues to move away from us as the mid-oceanic ridge in between us continues to spread apart, and we move apart about as fast as your fingernails grow, four to five, six centimeters every year. And that started 130 million years ago, 
And at that rate, if you do the calculations, it turns out to be about that amount of distance between us and South America. And the evidence for that breakup, besides the fact that we've got a mid-oceanic ridge in between us and we know that it's moving, that evidence comes from looking at the cliffs here along the edges. You can see some intrusions of what we call dolerite dikes, yeah. which are nearly vertical injections of a certain type of magma, quite different from the granite we saw at sea point contact. It's a much darker igneous rock, and it's essentially the same magma that's coming out in the middle of the ocean that's producing the oceanic floor that's separating the two continents. And if we look to the south, down through Chapman's Peak Drive, we can now see very clearly the contact, which is very well marked by Chapman's Peak Drive itself. They actually cut the road onto the granite surface. That's fascinating stuff. So the breaking up of Gondwana, was that it? Or are there still continents breaking up today? Yes, as a matter of fact, our own continent, Africa, is undergoing a split, or a potential split, anyhow. And that's expressed in the East African Rift, which you'd find to the northeast of us in East Africa. And it's starting to split, and some people believe that if that continues, eventually, 10, 20, 30, 50 million years into the future, we might have an East and a West Africa separated by an ocean. Still only a stone's throw from the city, we've arrived at the western shore of the Cape of Good Hope section of the Table Mountain National Park. And for Eleanor, that means meeting a fascinating group of locals. One of the extraordinary things about this reserve is that as you look around, you feel a million miles from everywhere. I'm surrounded by wilderness and fainmoss. The Atlantic Ocean is all around me and what feels like a whole kingdom of flora and fauna. And yet, just over there lies suburbia and South Africa's second largest city. The reserve and these mountains may keep the city out, but the city also keeps the animals in. Species that might usually roam over large distances if they were in the wild, suddenly find themselves effectively trapped here, stuck between the developments and the deep blue sea. And for a unique population of Chakma baboons, that challenge has led to a fascinating adaptation. Out here in the Fainbos, there's an enormously varied diet available, from roots and flowers to insects and even small mammals. But in this reserve, the baboons have added another element to their diet, seafood. Dr. Justin O'Rean and his team of researchers have been following the reserve's four troops of baboons, and we've joined him today for an unusual visit to the beach. You know, getting these off the rocks with your bare hands is really difficult. So how on earth are the baboons managing it? Well, there's no way they can do it with their, their hands, like you were just trying to do it there. And what they have to do is they get their faces flush with the ground, like this, and they essentially pry it off with their canines. And of course, their canines are larger than ours, so they, they can actually do that. And they test the limpets around. And if the limpet's slightly off the ground, they'll get the canine underneath and then pry it off. If the uh, limpet is reacting too fast and then they'll immediately move away because they've lost that opportunity and they'll go to another one and try it. So you can see here, this is a limpet that lost and effectively the baboon took a shortcut. Small enough, it actually just bit with its, with its incisors in this case. It just bit the top off and then would scrape out the limpet from the inside. Whereas in this case, the entire limpet was removed and crushed in the process of getting out the, the juicy flesh. That's amazing. Gosh. So what we have here is the whole troop who've come down towards the sea. Why? Well, the sea, the marine environment here, represents a unique resource for these baboons. They are, as you can see now, eating um, the equivalent of their salad. But here, down on the intertidal, 
you've got access to mussels and limpets, energy-rich, protein-rich food sources, rich in omega-3 fatty acids, rich in iodine, and so it represents a real bonanza of food for these baboons. So we always think of baboons as being associated with mountains or inland areas. Is this really unusual behavior, this coming down to the sea to forage? Mountains are places of refuge. They're not really a place where you uh, would find baboons foraging of their own free will. There are some foods up there, but generally they like to be in these low-lying areas as they're foraging right here. And these low-lying areas are, in this context, immediately adjacent to the intertidal zone. So we've shown in scientific research that mountains are sinks for populations. If, if troops move up into a mountainous area, the numbers drop compared to within the same geographical region, troops being lower down. So lower down is good for baboons. I don't know of another primate population that has access to an intertidal zone and forages in it. So it really does represent a very special scenario of a primate with access to a very important source of protein rich in, in essential fatty acids, which can only be an absolute bonus in terms of their reproductive conditions. So it might reduce their interbirth interval, it might enhance the fecundity of both females and males. And so they're sitting in a, in a really good position here because they have access to not only an enormous amount of vegetation, as you can see these baboons here foraging on what's the equivalent of salad. Right down here you've got your meaty protein. So they have the best of both worlds. These baboons might be hemmed in by suburbia, but for now, they've got more than enough leg room. The Cape Point Nature Reserve spreads over almost 20,000 acres of coastal wilderness, home to over 2,000 species of plants and 300 animal species, including 10 other troops of baboons that forage in the intertidal zone, making the diversity and natural splendor of this landscape a magnet for both local and international visitors. <laughs> if you come here during summer, you're pretty much guaranteed an encounter with one of the Cape's most powerful and omnipotent presence, the wind. We often tend to think of the wind as little more than a nuisance, eerie background noise. But it can be as iconic a feature in a landscape as any mountain or bay. And most every culture and region has its own particular wind, from the Santa Ana of California to the misulant fern of the Alps, from the Hamatan of Central Africa to the waterlogged monsoon of Asia. And here in South Africa, perhaps the most famous wind is this one, the Cape Doctor. The name Cape Doctor is slowly fading out of fashion. These days, most people around here simply refer to it as the Southeaster. A pity, really, because the old name has never been more appropriate. But it's not just the force of the wind that makes it so valuable, it's also its quality. See, the Southeaster is one of the cleanest winds in the world, reason being it's coming in straight off the South Atlantic. The air we're breathing in up here has been manufactured over Antarctica, and it doesn't get much cleaner than that. You hardly notice it on your way to the top of the point, but there's a small laboratory tucked up against the mountain, and it's here because of the unique quality of Cape Point's air. The Global Atmospheric Watch is an international project that monitors ozone levels, as well as the amount of carbon dioxide that is being absorbed by oceans around the planet. And this Cape Point station is on the front line of that science. There's just one more climb to the highest lookout point here. But once we get there, we'll be looking down on a whole new stretch of coast and starting a new journey around Cape Town's other bay. And then it's on to the southernmost tip of the continent. And if this side of the peninsula has been anything to go by, it's going to be something truly spectacular. We'll be dropping in on immovable locals, watching the great nomads of Walker Bay. New Jack and I will be paying homage to an old sea dog called Nuisance. But we'll also be telling the human stories of the shoreline, from its Stone Age residents to Liberian sailors who left their legacy in Simonstown. 
and a unique 19th century Muslim fishing community that still thrives today. So join us again as we march eastward toward a new ocean and its magnificent shoreline.